Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OEI webinar chapter seven, entitled Area Research, Research Cloud, Open to Face with Inline Layer One Acceleration. This webinar is presented by Florent Kartenberger, Assistant Professor in Communication Systems at UCOM, and Ruben Suarez da Silva, Engineer for the OSA Associate Member of SMART. Regarding questions, Please wait until the end of the presentation. We will answer your question live. Thank you for your attention. I'm now leaving the floor to Florian and Ruben. All right. Thank you, Camille. Let's get uh, started. Okay. It's my pleasure to be here today with uh, my colleague uh, Ruben. Ruben, want to say hello? Hello. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so, I'm, as Kami said, I'm from uh, Euricom, I'm a professor at Euricom. I'm also the, the general secretary of the Open Air Interface Software Alliance. And, uh, and Ruben is from our strategic partner, um, All Be Smart. Um, and today we're going to present to you a work that we have been doing together um, and with NVIDIA, with another of our strategic partners for, for a while now, um, which is called the Aerial Research Cloud. Uh, so it's, it's um, um, a platform that um, combines the open air interface layer two and above with the NVIDIA Aerial layer one inline acceleration. So what we prepared for you for today is um, is outlined here. So I'm going to give a, an, an introduction first into the topic. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the standardization um, aspect of, of this work. And then Ruben is going to take over and he's um, going to talk about the FAPI and the NFAPI standard, the different procedures and how all of this has been implemented in, in OAI. And then um, the second part is um, about the integration of the um, NVIDIA Aerial Layer 1 um, with, uh, with Open Air Layer 2 and above. And we've also prepared um, a, a demo for you um, to show you how this works in, uh, in real life. Um, and we're going to end the, the presentation with uh, some uh, outlook uh, on the future roadmap and, and some conclusions. Uh, as Camille said, um, I, we, we reserve some time at the end to answer questions. Um, if you want, you can put your questions in the, in the chat, um, but then we'll only go and handle them um, at the end of this uh, presentation. All right. So, um, since you're here for an uh, open air webinar, I'm not going to talk uh, about open air because I suppose you all know it. Um, I want to talk about um, the general trend in 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 five G networks. Yeah, we're becoming more becoming virtualized, open, and flexible. So, what you see here on this picture is um, the well, a simplified version of an of an open run. Uh, 5G network, okay, and uh, let me just point out the, the 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 basic elements here. So you have, um, first of all, on the on the right hand side, you have the the core network, yeah, which I called here the, the core cloud, with the different um, core network functions. So here are just depicted the AMF, the access and mobility management function, the the SMF session management function and the UPF, uh, the user plane function. But of course, you can have, depending on your application scenario, you can have um, more uh, network functions here in the in the core. In the middle is uh, what um, what people call the, the edge cloud. Um, so you have your, your centralized unit, um, which can also be split into two parts. Uh, the centralized units control plane, uh, CUC, centralized unit uh, user plane. Um, and they are both connected over the F1 interface um, to, the, to the distributed unit. Um, 
I also put here the, the near real-time rig, yeah, which is a key element in, in open run networks, um, which can communicate with the DU and the CU over the E2 interface and allows to run um, X apps for, um, for performance monitoring or also for uh, control and optimization of certain functions in the in the DU and the CU. Uh, there's also a non-real-time rig, um, but I, I, I didn't put it here on the slide. And on the left, you have the radio network, um, the radio units, um, which are connected to the distributed unit using the ORAM 7.2 interface, so which is a, a, a low-level split um, in, the, in the protocol stack, uh, transferring uh, frequency domain data between the DU and, and the RU. Okay. Um, so, what's the um, what are the challenges in such networks? So, these networks um, usually are deployed on a virtualized infrastructure, you know, so on, on on something like a like a cloud computing infrastructure. But uh, the problem is that the uh, the DU has to do a lot of heavy signal processing. So actually, if you deploy this on, on general purpose uh, processes, then, then basically 90% of the whole um, load is, is, has to be done in the, in the distributed unit. Yeah? So this uh, solution is not um, very well scalable if you run it on, on, on general purpose processing uh, units. That's why... Um, if you want to deploy open run virtualized open run at scale, you need hardware acceleration. Yeah. And uh, there are two basic approaches to hardware acceleration: um, inline versus lookaside offloading. Yeah. So inline um, offloading means that the that the complete layer one is is um, is is offloaded to a different um, entity, and this entity interfaces. Um, with the, the has an interface with the with the higher layers, uh, and then on on the other end on the south side it interfaces directly with excuse me with the radio. The look aside acceleration on the other hand does not offload the entire layer one. Um, so some parts of the layer one are still handled in the in the CPU, only the really most um, processing intensive tasks are um, offloaded to an uh, to an hardware accelerator. Yeah, for example, like the the channel um, decoding and and coding. So, in to give an in an overview of of um, what is available today in the in the industry, so there are different solutions available, both for for look aside and uh, and inline offloading. So I don't claim that this list is exhaustive, but that's that's some of the um, the main products you can find today. So for lookaside offloading, um, you have uh, different solutions. Um, typically, these are these are systems on chips, um, either FPGA or, or or not. So for example, the NXP Layerscape is is a, is a system on chip um, that has several hardware accelerators um, integrated, and that can be used for for lookaside offloading. Um, uh, Xilinx uh, or now AMD, uh, their their chips, their FPGAs, they are especially the RFSOC and the MPSOC are also suited for this kind of offloading. Um, so AMD Xilinx has actually produced these T1 and T2 cards, uh, which are dedicated to accelerate tel telco applications. And they they're very flexible. They can actually be used both depending on the on the, the firmware that, that you put on top can be used as as inline or local side. Um, offloading. On the local side side, you also have Intel FlexRun. Um, so Intel FlexRun provides um, a, a layer one implementation, but um, where from which parts can be offloaded to Intel FPGAs. And so this card here on the right here uh, has an Intel FPGA. And then for inline offloading, um, you have um, a solution from Qualcomm that's um, I, I believe it's going to be released soon, the X100. Um, you have what we're going to talk about extensively today, the NVIDIA Aerial, which is based on, on GPU, um, NVIDIA GPU plus the Mellanox NIC. 
Um, but you have other, also other players that are entering the market. For example, the Calorian has a has a card uh, with a massive parallel uh, processing architecture um, that um, that is well suited for inline offloading too. With respect to open interface, um, we support both solutions, so both Lucaside and inline acceleration. So Lucaside, um, we have, we have two solutions. We can either so, so both of them are uh, for the LDPC decoding. Um, one of them can offload to GPU directly based on the CUDA library. And another one um, can offload to AMD Xilinx T1 based on the DPTK um, BBDEV library. Uh, but these are topics of another talk. Today, we're going to talk about the NVIDIA aerial inline acceleration. Um, to put this in context with uh, standardization, so um, there are several um this um several standardization bodies that are involved in this so of course you have uh, 3gpp that specifies the um the the, the overall uh, network architecture and uh the the cu du and and all the signal processing or on um but the actual um acceleration um is specified by um, by Oran. Yeah, so Oran has, so this is part of working group six, cloudification of restoration working group. So they have several, several what they call acceleration abstraction layer profiles. Yeah, so both for inline and Lucas at acceleration, um, I put here the, the numbers and the names of the, of the specification documents. However, uh, keep in mind that um, uh, Oran only um, has stage one and stage two specifications. Yeah? So they don't um, actually specify how to implement this in detail, but they do have recommendations for um, stage three specifications. Uh, for example, for Lucaside, they 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 recommend to use um, BBDEV, which is part of DPDK, and for internet acceleration, they recommend using the small cell forum API. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is actually, um, Ruben will, will talk about the, that interface, but just one slide before handing over to Ruben. Um, so this is, this is um, again, a comparison between inline and Lucaside acceleration, but these um, pictures are taken directly from the, um, from the Oran specification. So the thing I want to, to highlight here in the, in the inline acceleration is that actually you need uh, two interfaces. Yeah? You need one interface uh, to interface between layer one and layer two, uh, so this is the this is the FAPI interface, and um, you have another interface um, here on the right to interface with the with the RU. And since this is Oran, obviously this um, they 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 recommend to use the Oran seven to two front hall to this um, to interface with the RU. Okay, so today we're not going to talk uh, about the, this uh, front hall, uh, this seven to two front hall interface. Um, we're going to focus um, because th that's kind of outside the scope of, of open interface. Well, at least in this project, um, we're going to today focus on the integration of the of the open interface layer two with uh, the NVIDIA layer one using the FAP interface. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Ruben to give you a more in depth overview of the FAP and and FAP. Thank you, Florian. Uh, I will now, as referred, uh, talk about FAPI and NFAPI that are defined by the small cell forum and more closely talk on the FAPI interface, which has been used to interface between the open air interface layer two and the NVIDIA aerial layer one. The FAPI interface establishes interoperability between suppliers of either hardware or software solutions by providing a common API that permits interchangeability of system parts. This way, it allows an easy way for new vendors to enter the market without too much re-engineering and thus allowing a competitive and innovative ecosystem for 5G small cell vendor vendors, be it of hardware or software. If you move. Sorry. Hello? What is yes. 
I think Florian cut off. No, you are there. Okay, it seems that Florin is having issues. But we can hear you, Ben. Uh, yeah. Perhaps I'll try to. Um... Let me then just uh, share on my screen. Um, presentation and we can start. Uh, if you can all see my screen can anyone confirm. Yes, yes. we can see your yes. screen. Okay, thank you. So as I've mentioned before, the FAP interface establishes the interoperability between suppliers, allowing a minimal barrier to entry for vendors and a competitive and innovative ecosystem for 5G small cell vendors. Um, to allow this interoperability, the FAP is splits the Shinode B between the layer one and layer two, as mentioned before. And defines this interface between them um, and defines some interfaces uh, internal to the FAPI, mainly uh, P5, which allows control and configuration of the physical layer, supporting the following operations, parameter query via the param request exchange, configuration, initialization, and termination. It also defines the P7 interface, which is the main data path interface and is used to transmit the data plane messages between the virtual network function, VNF, which is the layer two and above, and the physical network function, the PNF, which is the um, physical layer, which in turn sends and receives the data to and from the front end unit. It also defines the P19 interface, which allows control of the front end unit, which is a digital bundling of the digital front end, radio frequency, and analog beamforming blocks. But this interface is not uh, um, is out of the scope of this project. The NFAPI is the network is a specification defined by the small cell forum, extending upon the FAP specification and allows the VNF and PNF to communicate with each other through a network, uh, but still making use of the interfaces defined in FAPI, as well as the previously mentioned FAPI messages. While using FAPI, the VNF and PNF reside inside a single element, result, resulting in FAPI existing as an internal interface within the GNOD B. This means that both parts of the software are executed on the same host machine. And FAPI, uh, by expanding upon FAPI, the, is designed to use the communication over the network and thus allows for a physical separate, separation of the VNF and PNF. This also allows for more computing resources to be allocated to each component since we have a separation between both parts. The FAPI this defines a state machine for the physical layer with three different states, idle, configured, and running, and messages to move the layer one through these states. These are the P5 messages. While in idle state, we may use the param request message to query the supported capability, the config request 
to configure the file and move it to the configured state. While in the configured state, we may use the, the param request again to query the current configuration, the config request to change it, or a start request to move it to the running state. Only on this state will the layer one begin a transmission to the front end unit. While in the running state, we can use the config request to change its current configuration, but the, there are some limitations on the configurations that we may change during runtime. Finally, we can use the stop request to move it back to the configured state in order to change the complete configuration using a config request if required. The initialization procedure uh, begins with, uh, as mentioned before, a param request exchange, if this is required, then a config message uh, exchange, and finished by a start request. When the PNF receives a start request and thus is moved to the running state, it may respond to the VNF in two different ways, depending on how it's configured. If we are using system frame number and slot based synchronization, the file will begin sending slot indications to the VNF in order to indicate the start of a slot. If the file supports delay management, it will send a start response message after which it enters the running state. When we are using system frame number and slot, the uh, this system frame number and slot synchronization assumes that the layer two and three is always correct. Uh, it is possible for the synchronization Sorry about that. When using the system frame number and slot synchronization, the layer one sends the slot indications indicating the current SFN and slot to the layer two. The VNF upon receiving this starts the slot processing routine by sending a downlink TTI or a blink TTI request with the system frame and slot that it has received previously. If for some reason the message sent to the layer one doesn't have the same system frame number and slot as received, the file may drop the, the message and send an error indication indicating that the message received was out of sync. When using delay management, the slot indications are sent from the PNF to the VNF periodically, but in FAPI, but not in NFAPI, since the expected jitter of the front hall connection between VNF and PNF prevents this message from being appropriate for signaling a slot interval. Instead, the com combination of the FISync procedure and API message timing ensures the alignment of MAC commands to air interface slots. File synchronization generally refers to the achievement of a common timing reference between the VNF and the file instances, which is dependent on deployment requirements. And on the integration with the NVIDIA aerial, we are using system frame number and slot uh, synchronization. For the downlink scheduling procedure, a downlink TTI request is creating containing a PDSCH and PDCCH PDU for slot for a given slot. Then a TX data request is created with a MAC PDU. The PNF transmits this PDU to UE and uh, the VNF 
10 cents on a Blink TTI request to read the UE response. The UE either acknowledges or not acknowledges the PDU. In other case, this causes the PNF to send an UCI indication to the VNF. For the uplink scheduling procedure, the VNF starts by creating an uplink DCI request with a DCI PDU for a given slot. This is sent to the UE. The VNF creates an uplink TTI request with a push PDU for a future slot. And the UE then sends a MAC PDU to the PNF, which in turn sends a CRC indication and RX date indication to the VNF with the received data. Optionally, if a UCI is expected, a UCI indication is also sent from the VNF to the PNF. Now I will talk about the status of the current implementation in OAI. As mentioned before, the FAPI splits the GNODB in VNF and PNF. They both work in uh, similar ways. Uh, Right now, in OAI, the VNF consists of a thread that is polling a socket connected to the PNF. If no message arrives by the end of the slot, the schedule, scheduler is called and then a downlink P7 message is sent. And finally, it increments the system frame number and slot. Otherwise, if a message arrives from the PNF before the slot ends, the message is read the header unpacked to determine the, the message type, and then the appropriate handler is called. In regards to the PNF, uh, it works in much the, the same way with a thread pulling a socket. If no message arrives from the PNF, the VNF, sorry, the system frame number are incremented. And if a message arrives from the VNF, it's read, unpacked, and handled appropriately. The current status of the implementation, all the P5 uh, messages and initialization procedure are up to this uh, FAPI standard version 10.02. And this is done with merge request 1995. Uh, there have been fixes in the message reading, reading and handling on the VNF and PNF uh, sockets. There is also a correction for the handling of the TLV padding that is specified by the small cell forum uh, specification. There is also the harmonization with the L2 emulator and channel, channel proxy ongoing. And the NFAPI command line parameter has been changed for ease of use. The next steps on the FAPI implementation in OAI is to finish bringing the P7 messages up to the standard, having CSI reporting. Uh, we have achieved two layers in downlink in the integration with the aerial. Uh, after this, we have to use SRS over NFAPI. Uh, for this, there has been work done by Roberto. Um, after this, we want to enable two layers in uplink and four layers in downlink, and possibly in the future, eventually update the, the implementation to be up to standard with a more recent version of the FAPI uh, standard. So since the beginning of the last year, um, as Florian has mentioned before, we've been working in a project to integrate the open air interface VNF with the NVIDIA aerial PNF using FAPI as the communication standard between the two. The aerial Research Cloud provides GPU acceleration for layer one using the A100 GPU. And for more information on this pro project, for anyone interested, we you can follow the links present on the presentation. The PNF 
provided by NVIDIA is mostly compliant with version 10.02 of the small cell forum standard, which is why we have been using this version of the standard for the open air interface implementation. But there are some caveats in certain messages in which it has some parts of the implementation more aligned with 10.04 version of the specification. Also, the aerial PNF doesn't at all support the param exchange messages. So there is currently no way to query the capabilities of the PNF in uh, runtime. Perhaps I can give the floor back to Florian to talk a bit more in depth of the structure of the aerial SDK. Thanks, Ruben. Yes, I want to I want to show you a bit um, um, the more more details and and also how to set up the the test bed um, because that's that's um, quite a quite a challenging tool. On this slide, um, I mean, this slide only summarizes the, you know, the, the, the shows at which level we integrated the, the NVIDIA aerial into open interface. So you see that um, on, the, on the left here, um, you have the, the CU and the DU, and, uh, and the NVIDIA layer one is the lower part of the, of the DU. Um, and it it takes over all of the all of the layer one processing you know, from the LDBC encoding decoding rate matching scrambling inflation um, and even pre coding and and all of that um, and it communicates directly with uh, so on the southbound side using the ORAN seven to two split with um, a commercial ORAN radio unit. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Ah, yes. Um, so one interesting, important aspect here is that um, the NVIDIA layer one runs in a in a containerized uh, environment. So um, it's it's actually very easy to um, to set this up. Once you get access to the to the containers from NVIDIA, um, you just download the images and you 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 start up the containers. And these two, and and you can also run open interface in a separate container, um, or not. You can also run it on bare metal. It's up up to up to you. And uh, these two uh, communicate with each other using uh, uh, using a shared memory. So there's a library uh, provided by Nvidia that uh, that handles the interprocess communication between uh, between these two layers over over a shared memory. Um, the nice thing is that uh, because of this interface, um, the, you can and we, you will see that later in the demo. You can log uh, the, the the exchange between layer one and layer two, and it actually outputs a, a pickup trace that you can afterwards load in Wireshark, and you can analyze the FAPI traces in in Wireshark. All right. So, you know, if you want to set this up, um, you need um, a few a few things. Uh, I mean, this is a classical ORAN setup, so you need a, a front hall switch that uh, that uh, supports um, the ORAN front hall. So, in particular, that supports uh, PTP and and Sync E. So, the both the the DU and the RU need to be synchronized uh, using PTP. Um, so then depending on the on the frontal switch that you're using, so some switches have, have an integrated uh, PTP Grandmaster, some other switches require an external PTP Grandmaster. Uh, in our setup that we put up here at Euricom, we actually have a, a, an external Grandmaster um, that, that provides a sync to the frontal switch, and then we connected the radio unit uh, on one hand to the, to the frontal switch, and uh, the the server that runs the NVIDIA LA1 to the sorry to the other um, also to the switch. We run 
um, CU and DU on, on one server, so on the, on the server that includes the, the A1 on the GPU and the, uh, the Menonox CX6 6, 6 NIC. And uh, we use another server to run the, uh, the core network. Um, on the right hand side, we use uh, uh, a code CUE uh, for, for testing. So um, most of the time, we use the Quackdale module that you see down here. Um, uh, but it also you can also use um, uh, any other smartphone that's uh, that's supported by by open Adams. Okay. Is the demo next? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. So uh, we have prefer prepared a, a video demonstrating the uh, workflow of the using the Aerial Research Cloud, uh, and this is what the typical um, run would look like. I think you have to share sound on Zoom. Mm, share sound. show a small demo of the Aerial Research Cloud workflow. We begin by starting our core network containers as well as the Aerial L1 software. While the L1 is starting, we can check if the core network is ready by querying the container's health status. When they show us healthy and the Layer 1 is initialized, we can then start the Layer 2 software. The layer 2 will then configure the layer 1 and begin over the air transmission. When we achieve this status, we can then start the UA for it to connect to the network. After the random access procedure is finished, we can check if the UE has acquired a video session by checking whether it has an IP address, which we can see here. After we determine that it has an IP address, we can start an iperf server on the UE and then start an iperf client on the core network host. And thus transmitting data in an end-to-end -end connection to the UE. We can now stop the UE connection. We can check on the G B that it has been properly released and we can now stop the IP IPERF client as well as the layer 1 and layer 2 softwares. After stop, stopping both softwares, the layer 1 will prompt us to save a capture file that contains the FAPI messages exchanged between the layer 1 and layer 2, which will be saved as NVIPC Pcap. I have one of those capture files here from a previous run in which we can see the initial exchange from the L2N L1 with the config request and response exchange followed by the start request. After this, if we go further down, we can see that there are uplink and downlink PPI requests which are used to schedule downlink and uplink as well as PX data requests and RX data indications which are data to be transmitted to the UE so in downlink and received from the UE uplink. Thank you. I will now show us okay, so this was the demonstration of the usage of the aerial research cloud now give it back to yeah Florian. i would i would just like to, to pause here for a second and and uh, you know I, I really think that uh, that feature that we saw at the end of the video um with the where you can see the pcap um with the message exchange between the layer one and the layer two that's really that's really a cool feature of this um, of this setup. 
um, because it allows you to well, debug, but also to learn really about the, the FAPI standard. Um, you know, you can see the whole message uh, exchange. You can go down to the detail and, and you know, see all the parameters of each uh, transmission, you know, MCS, uh, TBS, and, and all of that. So this is a this is a really key, cool feature of this um, of this app. Brilliant. So to finish off, I, I just want to give a little um, overview of the of the roadmap. So this is um, what you see here is the the um, updated roadmap that will actually be officially presented in the in the workshop in a, in, in two weeks, um, but it's it's almost uh, finalized. Um, so obviously. Everything that uh, we do in Open Interface um, will also uh, be available in that um, uh, with with the video layer one. Um, in particular, I want to highlight um, three things here. So um, the demo that you just saw, uh, we can already do downlink uh, two layers. Um, so Ruben was a bit conservative on the on the demo there, but we can achieve uh, throughputs of up to almost 300 megabits per second of a downlink. Um, the uplink is um, we we can only do SISO um, at the moment and is limited to to 30 megabits at the moment. Um, here we are. Um, waiting for a, a new release of, of Arial to support um, uplink SRS so that we can support uplink MIME 2x2. So the Arial itself already supports um, a 2x2 receiver, but we need some, some other feature from a regulatory release uh, to, to enable that. So that those, those two changes are, um, are close, so, so it should be happening before, before the summer. And then um, until the end of the year, um, we also want to handle um, multiple uh, carriers in the in, in the layer two. So Arial can already support uh, multiple carriers or even multiple cells. So if one um, one Arial layer one can actually drive up to I think four um, four radio units. So you can have either four carriers or four four cells. Um, but that um, is is not yet supported in open interface, but that is planned um, before the before the end of the year. Um, just can you go to the next slide? Yes. I'm not sure if I mentioned it there. Yes. Um, so currently, um, the oil. The, um, so there's one merge request already available. Um, with some of the changes, um, but the rest is still in the private branch because uh, there are some header files in there that we that are dependent that that we can't publish. Um, we're resolving that as we speak, and uh, we hope to be able to merge the rest into the public develop uh, very soon in the next few weeks. Um, however, you still, if you want to replicate it yourself, you still need um, X, the the access to the Nvidia layer one has to be granted by Nvidia. And so you have to go to their uh, website <laughs> that we link here, and you have to request access to the to the layer one part. Yeah, they once they request, once they they grant you access, you can uh, you can uh, they give you access to the source code as well, but it's not uh, classical uh, open source. So you're not allowed, for example, to to you're you're allowed to modify it, but you're not allowed to redistribute it or or publish it yourself. Yeah, so so Nvidia keeps um, um, close close control on on that. Um, I would like to um, point you to one uh, documentation website. This is the first one here. Here you can find um, the the bill of materials. So someone on the chat asked for that, um, and you can find the detail detail installation guide, um, how to how to set everything up, um, including tutorials. Um, and then, last but not least, there are two more links. One is to an, uh, if you go to the virtual exhibition of Oran, um, you find a, a demo there too. And uh, there's also a talk, we also gave a talk at uh, NVIDIA GTC, which is their main uh, conference that happened in the, um, in April, also in March. 
anyway it's recorded and uh, you can uh, you can look at this uh, presentation too um, which gives you a little bit more um, of a more of a visionary picture of what you can do with uh, with the aerial research cloud um, in the context also of, of uh, AI and, and machine learning. Okay, I think that's it from my side. Ruben, you have some concluding words before we go to the questions? No, I have uh, nothing. Thank you for attending. We will now be taking mm -hmm. question, questions from anyone who has them, and hopefully we are able to answer them appropriately. Okay. Hi, Florian Sakti here. Hi, Sakti. Um, so, uh, so this, uh, the L1 functions uh, in the aerial card, are they uh, predefined functions uh, provided by NVIDIA or are they user modifiable? They are modifiable. So as I said, they, they give you um, the source code so you can go and dig in there and, and modify them uh, as you um, to your liking. Okay, to be honest, I'm... we haven't really done that here yet. So I'm, I'm no expert in the how their code is organized, but uh, you, you can do it. Okay, and uh, is it uh, open source or? Uh, um... The no, it's not. A, it's not a classical open source license. It's. Um, it's. I think they call it just source um, available or access to source. So it's not not an Apache or 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 G, not GPL license. Um, it they 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 keep the copyright and they give you um, they, they they grant you a license to use it for your for your own use, but you can't uh, go and and republish your your modifications. Okay, thank you. There is a question of submitting a chat. It say, yes. how much can you secure with this acceleration? Recently, we saw Orbismar demonstrated 400 megabits in downlink. This was on without the acceleration yes. or without the, uh, the acceleration. Yes, indeed. Um, so that's an excellent question, and I don't, I don't have the answer to that one um, yet. It is um, um, a bit tricky uh, to to do a fair comparison between the different versions. So between, um, you know, complete uh, software on on CPU, Lucasite acceleration, and and inline acceleration, because they all run on different platforms. So um you know it's 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 hard to compare of course you can always compare the, the processing times and everything um but i think the real interesting thing to compare and that's what actually operators are, um, are looking for is the power consumption um and and to compare that really between the three different uh, versions that that is a bit um, hard um at least I, I'm not really sure how to do that. If someone knows how to do that, I would be happy to to chat about that. Um, and yes, I, I also have to agree that so far we have not been, um, so from a performance point of view, um, you know, we, we can't do more with NVIDIA today than we can do without. But um, that will change. So I think as soon as we scale up to you know, to support multiple um, radio units and multiple carriers, multiple cells, you know, there you will get to the limits of the software only implementation. And there, and, and then I think once you scale up, you will be able to harvest the, the benefits of the, of the acceleration. Any other question in the chat that I open? Okay, let me take this one here. Have you tested any other ORUs besides the Foxconn? Um, so with um, with the Aerial, no, we have only tested the, the Foxconn because here we are uh, dependent on, uh, on, on NVIDIA. 
Um, I know that they have done tests with other REOs too, um, but that was in a different uh, context. So, so no. So in this setup that we were showing today, we've only tested the Foxconn IU. And if we wanted to test anything else, you know, we we depend on on Nvidia to to do that for us. Um, I see some of the questions were already answered on the chat. Um, I think the easiest, uh, you know, if, if your question has not been answered, the easiest would be to speak up. Um, uh, do we actually 300 Mbps of throughput on this with the 40 megahertz bandwidth? No, that's actually 100 megabits, uh, 100 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, One of the limitations, yes, I should mention it too. One of the limitations that we have is is because of the Foxconn RU, uh, or at least the version of the Foxconn RU that we have today, because um, we basically cannot use the the special slot. So the TDD configuration we're using is um, three downlink, one special, one uplink, but we can't use the special slot, so we only have one slot to schedule a connect. And that means that on the downlink we can actually only use two slots for one user. And that's why we limit it to 300 megabits. That's in, in that configuration, that's that's the maximum that you can have with two layers. And one user. Well, and the subcarrier spacing is 30 kilohertz, right? 30 kilohertz, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, I see another question here about the uplink performance to 30 megabits. Limited is limited to 30 megabits. Um, what's the reason for this limitation? Um, that's also an excellent question. Um, so again, we we only first of all we only have one slot um, uplink uh, available. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so one. So it's it's to be honest, it's not uh, entirely clear uh, to us either um, what it is. But um, we recently um, discovered that uh, some um, sometimes the, the the latency of the layer one is 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 high is higher than than we would expect in the layer two, and therefore we get uh, we get some drop packets on the on the uplink. Um, that um, so so we're working on 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 optimizing this. This requires a bit of um, reworking of our of our layer two, um, but we we're working on this. Hey Florian, I have one other question. Yes. So, what is the difference between this aerial uh, hardware and uh, and implementing the L1 functions on a on a commercially available GPU? Well, it, it provides um, more functionality. I mean, it it has not only the, the layer one acceleration, but it also has the the, the frontal processing, well, processing the, 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 the interface, the, the ORAN 72 interface to, to interface with a commercial radio unit. OK. So without uh, you... without that, uh, yes. I think uh, even um, even if we want to do on a commercial uh, GPU ourselves, that would be uh, the uh, not not the inline implementation, the other one, right? Yes, exactly. If you if you want to do it on, okay, you know, by yourself, uh, let's say, um, you can only do the. Or, or if you if you only have the, the GPU without the network card, it would be a in um, sorry local side acceleration. Okay, got it. Thanks. Hi, Florian. Here, uh, Mikkel. Um, just uh, uh, a quick question: Do you know if what they are using for for calculating the things are they using? More precisely, half precision floating point format or, or uh -huh. I I don't know. I've never looked into the code in that in that level of detail. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I don't know the answer to the question. 
Okay, okay, thank you. Dorian, there's a question. Hi, this is Irfan. Uh, have you tested with any other RUs uh, beside Foxconn? Oh, we talked it already. No, the answer was um, the answer was no. So the the Nvidia aerial has not been tested with anything else. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay. If there are no more questions, Camille, I think uh, we can close the, the session. Do you have uh, plans on extending to version 2.5.0? Two, two, two Marcy. Um, Yes, uh, we have plans. We just don't know how to. What's the what's the best way to do that uh, yet? Um, you see, it's always a chicken and egg problem um, because we, of course, we need to keep the. I mean, for the moment, um, the Nvidia Arial is is um, version two with some extensions, um, so we can't just update uh, while while. You know, we need to update in parallel, basically. Um, but these discussions are ongoing and, and they will happen eventually. We just don't have an exact time plan on this yet. But you know, if you have another um, layer one that we can interface with uh, that uh, already supports this other version, um, you know, that, that um, then that could, could accelerate things. All right. Okay. So I think that we don't have any more questions. So I thank you all for your attention and uh, I'm closing the webinar. Thank you, Florian, and thank you, Robin. Oh, there is a last question. I don't know if you want to take this one. Have you tried listening with the YAUE? Uh, well, that's fast. No, we haven't uh, done that yet, but there's no reason it should not uh, work. I mean, you know, it works with the COTSUE. So in, in, in the Within the limitations of the OAI, way it should also work. All right. Thank you for Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.